Well, the women started with a simple premise, which is that we live in relationship with one another and that we're essentially relational responsive people. So the idea of a sort of isolated individual standing alone, looking up at the sky for sort of eternal principles, whether they were Kantian principles or whatever, you know, was, it was like, no, 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 look, look around you. You know, you live, it's like you live, we live on a trampoline. And if we take, if we move, it affects a whole lot of people. So you have to be very aware of those relationships. So it was not as if women were taking the opposite. They were questioning the whole paradigm, not explicitly, but implicitly. I remember I was teaching a section of this class where they were talking about moral dilemmas. You know, if you were in a lifeboat, and you jump out, you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, then there was the Vietnam War was going on and college students were being drafted. And in my section, uh, I, we tried to talk about the war and the students didn't want to talk about it. And I thought that was very interesting, particularly the men. And the reason was, I realized, is that their decisions about the war were based not only on you know, timeless principles of just and unjust war, but how their actions would affect people who they loved and care about, their family, uh, you know, maybe um, a love relationship or something. And they knew that to care about relationships was to be like a woman. So they didn't want to say it. But they also had enough integrity that they didn't want to misrepresent themselves. So I remember as a teaching move, I... Uh, we read Camus' novel, The Plague, which is if you suddenly find yourself in the middle of a city, you know, and the plague comes, even though you didn't, weren't responsible, what was your responsibility to other people and so forth? And I remember it was great because we we're in this long discussion of this novel, The Plague, and one of the students said, that's the draft dilemma. And then we really started talking about it. So I knew that this these theories that represented men as thinking only in the abstract, if they were morally mature and so forth, were not reflecting men's life either. But it was after that time of hearing women's voices, and I have to emphasize that because in that study we interviewed at street clinics in the south end of Boston and it, you know, in university health services, we had the most, we had a very diverse range of women's voices, both in terms of ethnicity and, and social class. And it was listening to other women that focused, for me, what was the problem in these theories that weren't representing women or men accurately. And that's why my book was called, not in a woman's voice, but it was called In a Different Voice. And here's a different voice and a different way of listening to men and women and to ourselves. Instead of whose rights took precedence, the question was, what is the responsible thing to do when you find yourself in a situation of relationship where there seems to be no way of acting that will not cause hurt? So, for example, one woman was a nurse and she was married to a roofer who was out of work. And she had scoliosis of the spine and she had one child who was one years old and she was Catholic. So. Her doctor told her if she continued the pregnancy, she would have injure her spine and she would be unable to work or care for her child. So what does she do? You know, it's not like whose rights take precedence. What does she do in relationship to herself, her Catholicism, the existing child, the unemployed roof of her husband, her spine? It, it, and so instead of this sort of what's the absolute right thing to do, it's like, you know, what is the better thing to do in a situation where there's no good thing to do? And, you know, it was interesting because one of the things that was so amazing to me is as I listened to women, there was this understanding, particularly then, but I think still now, that the good woman is selfless, that the good woman, you know, is responsive to everybody else's needs. So I would hear women tell me that you, it wouldn't even matter what, like that they were going to, they wanted to have the child because their boyfriend wanted them to, or they wanted to have the abortion because their parents wanted them to finish school or something like that. And I would say, you know, and they would say, and I want to be responsive to them. And I would say, that's great, but what do you want? 
And they would look at me and they would say, what's wrong with being responsive to other people's needs or to people's needs? And I would say, nothing. I said, but you're a person. What about your needs? And why is it good to be responsive to other people and selfish to respond to yourself? Because that's the word they would use. Whatever they wanted, if it was to have the abortion or continue the pregnancy, that was selfish. And, and they would look at me, this was in 1973, 4, 5, and they would say, good question. And it was this, this whole ethic of selflessness was morally problematic because it was an abdication of voice and relationship and responsibility. But if women came into these relationships, then it was going to be a different conversation. That's what that book was about. So, you know, I hadn't seen it, and it was a moment of, you know, what would you call it, like epiphany. And I remember sitting down at my kitchen table and writing this paper called In a Different Voice, just to make sense of, my, of the situation. And then it was amazing for me to discover that so many women felt the same way, that we were not supposed to say what we knew from experience. Mm -hmm.